Thank you for being here. Thank you for agreeing um, to be on. You are my favorite HR leader ever. Um, and yeah. <laughs> um, and I, uh, you know, just I want this session to be one. You and I were talking earlier. The travel industry is still experiencing 19 percent unemployment. Um, my team and I are on a hospitality family Facebook group where every day uh, someone else says, well, I got the email today. I got the letter today. My job is now terminated, uh, eliminated, uh, no longer furloughed. Occasionally we'll get, hey, I was called back, um, but not often. The other thing that's happening is, you know, it, they're keeping people and salespeople perhaps are working the front desk. They're you know, working um, in sales part of the day, and they're they might be working in housekeeping another part of the day. So people are playing. Those that are left are under a tremendous amount of stress. Um, you know, with the amount of hours they have to work, and that they're having to do roles that they're not used to doing. So it's just been a devastating time for the industry. And so I want um, you know this session to be one that encourages people that can help upskill them or give them some advice and some direction on. You know, how do my skills translate to other industries or other positions in hospitality? How could I go from a hotel company perhaps to a technology company? Because, you know, there are some technologies that are rapidly advancing in hospitality, like touchless technology and, and um, you know, that type of um, tech. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, people are, are kind of coming out of there being stunned to what am I going to do? What's my next step? How do I find a job? How do I support my family? Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about you and how you've gotten to where you are and then talk to some specifics about, you know, how people can cross skill and, and how, um, they can represent themselves in a more generic way, perhaps to get, um, positions in other industries. But, but I want to go back to you. Um, so how did you cultivate your passion for human capital and for leadership? Um, where did that come from with you personally? Well, I'm sure um, I took the most non-direct path possible to a career that centers <laughs> around human capital and leadership. My very first job was my dream job, and it was to work for Walt Disney World. That was my dream. I literally went to school with like networking with that in mind. I went to business school with that in mind, and I got the job, and it was better in reality than the dream. It was so amazing oh. in Florida. I was in theme park operations, not in hospitality at Disney, but at the scale of Disney, 35,000 people, how do you get them to do this amazing work of delivering a magical experience and not see a supervisor in sight? How do you mm -hmm. get behavior to match your strategy um, is kind of my takeaway, my, my first inkling of how do, how do you operationalize that? How do you get, because you can't just like force people, the beatings will continue till the morale improves. You can't just do that. You have to somehow get the right people and inspire them to day in, day out, do that. And so um, when I eventually left Disney, I was hired to, hey, can you do the training for our staff? It was a big sports venue where concerts and sports <laughs> are played. And um, they wanted to disnify it so they could charge more for their, corporate suites and boxes and mm -hmm. needless to say um, I left Orlando I actually was working at Disneyland by then and I came to Philadelphia where it is not Disney World there is no desire to deliver this Disney-like experience and that was my job and so it was quite a battle and um, it was like mm -hmm. reality hit me but the training um, parts of that job led me to other training jobs where I realized this is actually a function with some um, theory behind it and some frameworks behind it. You can actually apply this to other industries. It's not just a Disney culture thing. And so mm -hmm. that's sort of where my career began was the, how do you get people to behave and deliver service? So in businesses that, that don't have a human capital, like it doesn't matter if you quit, we'll just replace you. Those kind of businesses, you don't need a person like me because like the people are commodities. And I did take one job and I realized, oops, there are commodities here. You really don't need me. But mostly it's mm. been where people are your competitive edge or the heart of the business and what create almost mm. your brand. And so that's really where like my passion is. So it led me into further deeper into HR. I would still say to this day, maybe this is why you like me, Carol. Like I never grew up in HR. I never grew up with policies and employee relations and compensation and benefits. 
those, I always had to have um, good people around me to do that part of it. I was really more about like, how do you make organizations shine? And so like, that's where my passion is. And honestly, it kind of rises and falls on leadership. Good leadership um, that drive great culture equals this amazing experience. And all the campaigns and slogans in the world don't translate if you can't have leaders who have a heart for it. So absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, I remember working with you the first time I met you. I remember walking into the office in New York City and um, sitting across from you. And, uh, you know, your questions were more related to, uh, you know, uh, the, the business and how it would work and how we would work together. And how we would bring teams together and how we would focus on the product versus a lot of those HR type questions. Yeah. And I think we just bonded over that conversation. Yeah. And then, you know, I just saw you um, develop programs that uh, were amazing for employees and especially the conference that we did uh, together and, and the exercises that you put us through were, were phenomenal and very thought provoking. So, um, you know, I think that uh, there aren't that many, uh, HR executives out there that I've run into that have the creativity that you bring to the table for sure. So I appreciate That's that. Nice of you to say. Um, oh, you're welcome. So, um, so tell us about a time in your career and you, you mentioned it a little bit, but maybe yeah. delve more deeply into how did you go from Disney World operations and shift to a different discipline into HR and then you weren't in hospitality HR all the time. You crossed over. So how did, how did you do that? How did that work for you? So that is one of two big, drastic, abrupt changes um, that I made, like pivots, I would even say, in my career. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it in its entirety, it seems to like there's a threat. Um, so I made the decision to pivot from hospitality into um, tr training and development because uh, I wanted to live where I wanted to live. And there weren't mm. that many jobs where I was going into Philadelphia. And I went from California to Philadelphia. And so I sort of took a job that would want something about my skill set. I had literally no experience in training and development. I didn't know what to do. I had no idea how to operationalize training and what it should look like. I mean, it was pretty much it was pre PowerPoint presentation, but it was pretty much a mm -hmm. presentation of like, I would talk and they would listen. So I mm -hmm. cringe, a little, cringe a little bit thinking about my efforts back in the beginning, didn't know what I was doing, but it was mm -hmm. about being where I wanted to be and finding something in my background that somebody valued. And honestly, mm -hmm. it was a connection to Disney that brought me there. So my network mm -hmm was the thing that opened up a door mm. that was like, didn't on paper make sense, but, but he gave me a shot, which led me down this new path that I was on. So mm -hmm. that was one, that was my reason. And then the second big one is when I left Travel Click, which is where you and I both worked, I decided mm -hmm. that it was time for me to start something on my own. And it was because I got to a point in my life where I knew what I really loved and was good at. And also what the aspects of the job that I wasn't good at and didn't get any enjoyment out of. And I thought I could make it on my own and make as much money, it turns out more. Um, and I say that too with like optimism of sometimes it surprises you, like mm -hmm. now you're not limited by your salary, like anything's right. possible and you're only limited by how hard you're willing to work and how valuable the work is. And so um, it, I think you get to a point in your career where you just know what you like and what you don't like. And so I left the head of HR from being inside of a company to doing this kind of OD work that I do, the part, the slice of that job that was good. And I only do that slice that I love. And, and so I yeah. think it's important to know what you'd like to do and be willing to mm -hmm. take a risk to do, because when you're in the element that suits you, that is clearly your strength and maybe even your passion, it shines through to people, it becomes contagious and it becomes valuable because they know that you really care about it and think about it all the time and it makes you, you good at it. So I guess I just say, yeah. find something that you're passionate about and try to like find ways to do that in a different environment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of transitioning that to, to the to people out there that are um, you know, 19% of travel unemployed right now. Um, and, you know, many of them, um, you know, all over the spectrum from, uh, from entry level all the way to executives at hotel companies have, have lost their positions. Um, 
pilots have lost their jobs at airlines and uh, flight attendants and, and ground crew and, you know, cruise lines are decimated, right? So there's just so many people out there. Um, and, you know, the thing that I love particularly about hospitality and hotels of the travel industry is the passion that most people in hotels have for hotels. And there's something that gets in your blood after that first hotel you work in yeah. and you just kind of have it in your blood. And so people are now looking at, I don't know when I'm going to get another hotel job because um, it's, I mean, it's gone the way we know it and we know it'll come back, but we don't know when. Um, and there have also been some mistakes made along the way um, where, as you said, people have been commoditized and not cared for um, during this process. Um, and so some people have kind of a bad taste in their mouth about what they've been through and are looking at other opportunities. And, and we've had the question, and I've seen the question on the Hospitality Family Facebook group a lot, like, how do I translate my skills to something else? How do I, how do I um, you know, craft my resume or how do I, re you know, apply for a job and, and take, you know, my hotel sales skills or my hotel revenue management skills or my front desk skills or, you know, how do I translate that to another industry or even to cross over into technology and hotels um, so that someone will actually think I'm qualified and I can get an interview? Like, do you have any advice on, on how somebody can look at their skill set? And like you said, you figured out what was transferable yeah. from Disney. So how, how do we look at that and figure out what's transferable and what might be important to, to the job we're trying to apply for that may not be in hotels? Well, can I start and like react to what something you said? I truly yes. believe in my heart that travel will be back. And I yes. think it's going to go through a phase of reentry that's going to be bumpy. So I think there's pent up mm. demand and people are going to want mm -hmm. to travel. I know I will as soon as it's possible. I'll even take some risks yeah. to do it. But yeah. I think that with that first time back is not going to be what it was. And it's going to be really disappointing because all the people who made it so great and made the operation run smoothly and seamlessly and seem to care are not there or there are like half mm -hmm. as many of them as there were before. And so, and then people mm -hmm. are going to hesitate to go for a second time and a third time, and it'll take a while until it builds back up to being what it was, even when it's allowed, mm -hmm. but I still think it'll be back. So I just want to give this little ray of hope that like, it's not, not mm -hmm. going to be there. It just won't be the same mm -hmm. at first. And maybe people don't want to go back for the reason you just said that they were treated poorly and without care um, during this time, and they're they're they just don't feel um, any trust to go back to their industry. So I get it. I just wanted to paint like a little ray of hope. So yeah. it's to go back to like my own story. It's so important to know what is it you like to do. And the qualities that you want to avoid at all costs, because that's just not you, or it doesn't appeal, or you know you're not good at it, and and to, to target, not literally, but figuratively around the things that you like. So if you say, I used to be front desk, or I used to be revenue management, or I used to be food and catering, you have to get underneath that title and that function to find out what underneath it do you like. Because I can tell you right now, people in other industries would kill for the thing hospitality has done right for a long time. And that is deliver a great customer experience. They want literally, can't we be like hospitality in sporting venues? Can we be like hospitality in banking, in retail, in healthcare? They want people who are um, of, a, of a heart for service that is associated with hospitality. So I think for, I don't even know, two generations, hospitality has been on the forefront of being the sort of the role model of, of nurturing and warmth and friendliness and welcoming. And so industries want that. And so I think if you tr can get at the heart of what you love, so if it's food and bev and you're thinking, I love nourishing people or I love bringing happiness through food and you can articulate that, then I think you could go into an industry that centers around food or an industry that centers around service. Right now, healthcare is still booming uh, with a couple of asterisk exceptions, if they get really overwhelmed with COVID, they won't be able to do elective um, treatments and um, then, then they struggle a little bit. But I think in general, the healthcare still needs people with hearts for service who not, don't necessarily have healthcare backgrounds. I want to give you the term of the position that they're looking for. Um, patient experience. 
those are the jobs that they're looking to fill from hospitality. We need people to do patient experience. It's like a job, the director of PX, you know, abbreviated mm -hmm. patient experience. They want that. Um, customer experience is a title in other industries that don't use the term mm -hmm. patient. Um, and I want to tell you a little secret. I've spent a lot of my consulting time in the last 10 years working with technology startups. And the technology startups want a couple of things that I think hospitality has. One, they want those revenue management positions because they're really analytical and they translate into like a financial um, profitability mindset. Um, some of these tech startups want that mindset of how do we take a lot of data and turn it to decision-making that's revenue generating. And the other is a position called client success. I think it used to be called account management before, but these B2B companies that sell software into businesses, they want uh, client success leaders. Now, if you don't like sitting at a desk, being on the phone or looking at a computer screen all day, then that may not be for you because that's what that's going to entail is a lot of like this, sitting at home, working from your desk. But um, I know that those are in sharp demand. And the third one is something called product management. You know that title, Carol, I think. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> yes. In, co in consumer brands, the job's called brand management. But in technology, it's called product management. And this really is almost like a mini general manager job where you have complete oversight for uh, the product, it's brand positioning, um, re hitting revenue targets. So you're the hub of a wheel that has marketing, sales, engineering, and they work around you. And I really feel like in certain segments, um, hospitality leadership roles would lend themselves to product management really well. Mm -hmm. And I feel like product management is so in demand and they don't teach it in college. There's no major that's like the product management major. There should be because these are the jobs that are in hot, hot demand. And so if you can make an argument of how you're a business person who managed multiple functions to lead your your facility, your, your um, site, your hotel site, um, profitability by managing various functions. That's literally what you did. You product managed your hotel. So I think yeah, that's, no, that's great. Yeah, that's great, Grace. I mean, I think um, you know, that business acumen side, like if you looking through your career experience, what is your business acumen? Where are the things that you understand? And and those three areas, you know, I saw recently um, Adele Gutman uh, recently went out on her own. She led social uh, media and marketing and revenue for a company based in New York, but they they were always number one and number two on TripAdvisor, like everywhere they went. And so now she started a new company um, and she mentioned that um, now doctor's offices and medical facilities are wanting to hire her to improve yes. their patient experience. Yes. So yes. when you said that, I was like, oh my yes. goodness, yes. like, yes. Um, and that directly co correlates to what we've done in hospitality. And I think, you know, senior living, um, you know, how you have that uh, interaction with the families and with the patients. Um, it, they're in, in rental communities uh, all yeah. over the, the U.S. There's that as well. I mean, there's there are a lot of things that I think um, have this cross section with hospitality uh, that, you know, you I, I think sometimes we get really specific in our resume. And I think right now might be a time for us to take it up a level um, and get specific when it talks about profitability and numbers you produced and that type of thing. But uh, you know, don't say I know the CRS, like say I've managed enterprise systems across multiple hotel companies or something like that, you know, like stating things a bit differently, I think is important um, when you're not, you can't use the the hotel terms and vernacular and the all the acronyms that we have. You've got to kind of take it a step above that um, to, to stand out. Um, so what do you... Um, a lot of people are saying like their resume just gets rejected all the time. Like they have these automated systems that reject them and they just can't even get a call and interview. They get an, you know, the auto rejection. Um, is there a way to stand out in that environment or not really? At the risk of saying the obvious relationships always matter um, to get to the top of the pile. 
And you know that the way the systems work, everybody has applicant tracking systems. They do Boolean searches on words. So you wanna look at the words of the job and make sure those words are also in your resume. They do word matches. I don't know if everyone understands how LinkedIn and Indeed work on job posting, even Glassdoor, but like, I just wanna say this in case somebody out there doesn't realize. When you're on LinkedIn, I even tell anybody who's looking for a job, always um, search for the job types that you want, even if you're not qualified, or even if you're curious, search in LinkedIn, it picks up your search almost like Google does. And from then on, we'll feed you jobs because you looked for those in your search on LinkedIn and you'll keep getting mm -hmm. prompted. Not only that, but recruiters looking for jobs with that title will see your profile come up on their LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the number one place that recruiters are looking and that uh, whether you're a staffing agency or inside. And so LinkedIn becomes really important in this phase. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the job seeker mode turned on and it costs $10 a month last time I saw it, just the last thing somebody not working needs is to pay $10 a month. That should be free, I think, and pay if you're not looking for a job. But anyway, um, the, what the job seeker mode does is everything, well, everything I just said happens even in the free mode, but the job seeker mode amps it up, then your profile will come up higher in search results to recruiters. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to have that mode up when you're actively looking is to have job seeker mode. So the same with Indeed, what the jobs that you search for in Indeed is what Indeed will now start to feed to you. So you can create a profile, I want jobs in hospitality, but if you look in healthcare, if you look in um, food service industry, whatever you look at is what Indeed will start to feed you, whether you put it in your profile or not. So make sure you're actively mm -hmm. looking and, and it actually accelerates. So you get more and more and more, um, the more searches you do, the more applications you put in. And so it, that's them trying to help you. So I just want you to like game the technology, not resist the technology. It can be your friend or your foe, but technology. That's and great advice. Yeah, yeah. So going on to that relationship side of things, you know, one of the things that um, we were talking about a little bit was personal branding. And I just, I, you know, I want to share my personal story with that. And I think you've also shared how, you know, you got that connection from Disney to transition to a different position in Philadelphia. And through networking and you know my career has been built on networking and that has been um, you know I've never gotten since the early days of my career I've never gotten a job without knowing someone um, and that has been just that's been key um, and the ways that I've done that is um, dedicating myself to association work in my industry um, and dedicating myself to, to um, board and association work in uh, across industry. So, um, you know, I think that um, in, in building a personal brand, it's also important, you know, if you get an opportunity to have a speaking engagement or to write a curriculum or to write an article um, in an industry publication or somewhere else even, um, to blog, to do things that um, people are picking up on and that your name is out there, it builds your personal brand. It, 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 you then start being seen as a thought leader in your industry. And so early on in my career, I was president of Hedna, you know, in my 30s. And um, it was my, I set a goal and I said, this is what I want to do. And in six years, I became president. So, but I worked my, you know what, off um, on the board um, for four years before I could do that. And it was like having, a, a, you know, two full-time jobs at some point um, when we didn't have a management company to manage the association, but it was worth it in the end. In the end, my career has been uh, rewarded because of it. And my network has grown, grown deep and wide. Um, and, and, you know, that has been of benefit um, to Dragonfly as well. So, you know, I think that it's very important um, to realize throughout your career um, that uh, ability to network um, and to build those relationships. And right now, we're not seeing each other face to face at conferences and meetings. So, you know, picking up the phone and calling somebody and asking them how they're doing and if you haven't talked to them in three years, I mean, start building that um, those relationships back if you've let them wane because you've been too busy at work or whatever. Um, I just think um, that 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 the aspect of networking and the aspect of um, you're putting yourself forward uh, for things that move the industry forward 
um, or that um, grow your skills um, as an individual, getting your, your certifications and that type of stuff is, is you know, something that's really important to, to growing your opportunities in the future. Um, so if you haven't done a lot of that, I suggest you do it um, and you do it now and Carol, you continue wanna, that throughout your career. I want to share my experience with my network with you and see if you find this same correlation to be true. The people okay. who I absolutely think are going to be slam dunk helps to me when I need help, referrals, business, never come through for me. The people who I didn't ever dream would help me. Somebody's brother-in-law, somebody's, you know, old boss that I never met who they introduced me to that I think is a very low probability of having something tangible. They're the ones who come th true, through. I just always find the person you least expect to be tangibly helpful is the most, for some reason, is the most tangibly helpful. Um, you and I used to work with somebody together at Travel Click. Uh, he was a peer of mine. And he, if all the people who I thought would ever be of service and help to me in my business, he's been the most help and service to me in my business. And all the people I thought would hire me in a heartbeat and like had tons of work for me, like they're social friends, but they're not professional, like generating any tangible work for me. So, you know, I, I would say at Dragonfly, um, I have a little bit of that, um, but I also, you know, had my business before and I had business partner there who has really been a part of sending a lot of business our way and um, and my mentor has as well so you know I think that um, I have a mixed bag on that but I think the point of that is don't ignore any of yeah. them right like like your your network isn't just those that are in this circle there's this circle yeah. and this yes. circle and there's and part of the research circle is oh well she can refer me to him who can refer me to her yeah, yeah. and then there's a recommendation right so um so i think uh, you know i've had a little bit of both but i i definitely don't discount those tertiary and even beyond um connections that i have yeah exactly yeah. so um what is your uh opinion of and i mentioned a little bit of this but how do people network in the midst of a pandemic? How do they network in the midst of a pandemic? Um, well, if one thing's for sure, you have more time at your desk. Um, so <laughs> yeah. seem to have more than normal. Um, it's a time to get in touch with people that you haven't been uh, in touch with in a while. And especially if your work life has changed, there's not as much work or it's a different kind of work. It gives you like this gift and you're almost like, what do I do with the gift? Should I work out, read a book or start networking? Um, I don't know. I haven't found networking to be that hard during the pandemic. It's been exactly like this. I'm all Zoom all the time. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. sometimes for people, I've actually had people ask me, can I please not turn on the camera? I just don't <laughs> yeah. like, Sure. Um, so I don't, I feel like I have the gift of more time. Um, what I do miss is the in-person. So I think before I used to do mm. less of it, but it would take like four hours to get to the place we're having lunch, to have the lunch, to drive back. Uh, and now I can probably do like 10 people in those four hours that I have meaningful conversation with. So I kind of want to talk to you about like this system that I use and that I recommend about how to uh, network and not become obsessed and okay. stressed out about it. By the way, I'm an introvert. So like networking for me is like- Me too, effort. me too. Yeah, it's, I, I've got to have a system because like it's really an effort that I would dread otherwise. So my system mm -hmm. is to choose a number, an odd number, one, three, five, seven, nine, less than 10. Usually when you're starting out, three or five is a good starting place. And whatever the number is, say it's three, I make three connections with people for three days each. So in total of nine. And these are people who I haven't been in touch with in my normal day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week activity. So I force myself to find these nine people that I, and I have some interaction with them. Depends on who it is. I used to like say coffee or lunch could be one of them. Right now, maybe, pr probably not. Um, I, it could be a text message, could be an email, but mostly it's a request for a live phone call or Zoom. And in that conversation, I say, so if it's me, I say, I'm looking for work doing X, Y, Z. Um, do you know any companies who need help in this area? 
or this geography or this type of project. And if you're looking for a job, hey, I'm looking to make a transition in my career. I used to be in hospitality and I'd still like to be customer facing or I'd like to be product management or revenue management, something that they can say, oh, so of the 10 calls that you make, nine calls, um, seven of them will say, I don't know of anything, good to hear from you, I'll keep you in mind. That's, that's the bulk of them. All you need is one, but usually you'll get at least two or three who will say, oh, I know somebody you should talk to. So don't be upset about the rejection mm -hmm. rate of the, of the majority. Be focused on the one or two or three. And you will probably spend the next two weeks following up on those two or three leads that they gave you, and they will get you two or three more leads. It is shocking how many, the minute you hang up within six hours, oh, I saw a job on LinkedIn. Oh, my brother-in-law, my old colleague is looking for such and such, and you just mentioned it. Things seem to come together in this law mm -hmm. of attraction that they wouldn't have been thinking of you, but because you called, they see this job and they mm -hmm. refer you to it. I've literally never had to market my business in 10 years, knock on particle board, um, because like just having these and being open and vulnerable about the, I'm looking to make a change. I'm looking to develop business. Don't pretend like everything's great. And I've got more business than I could do. No, I always like, here's what I love to do. If you know of anybody who needs it, or, or there's somebody, the very least, are there three people you think I should talk to who might be able to point me in the right direction? Don't leave that phone call without getting three people who can point you in the right direction because they might not have something, but they'll have somebody. I do think that a lot of people are, and sorry, I'm talking so much. I'm really excited about this topic. I no, I love this. I love this. It's very practical advice and that's exactly what we need. So I love it, Grace. Well, if you chose the number five, you would have had 25 of these. So every day for five. So get up in the morning, do five connections. If they never return your call, okay, that's one of the ones you can write off. But um, you'll have 25, you're stirring energy up. You're stirring up conversation. You'll start to become on people's minds and then you can stop. Like you don't have to obsess all day and either not do anything because you're so like frozen in the headlights or like obsess and make 105 calls and then you've burnt out your network in the first day. And so you want to pace yourself and that 25 calls or the nine calls, whatever number you choose, that's like weeks of follow-up work. That's weeks of following up on leads and lunches and conversations and scheduling Zoom meetings with those 25 people who give you, you know, five leads and those are good leads. And so like, stop, like do it for five days, then stop till you finish working through that network. Because the worst thing you could do is get a good lead and not have the time to follow up on it because you have so many other leads. Right, right. So pace yourself and know what you can handle, right? And and what you're saying is start small initially. If you haven't been doing yes. this, well, start small and then you can just, grow it. Yeah. And just have the discipline to do, to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's great advice, Grace. Really great advice. Um, so what are some of the out of the box questions somebody might get asked in an interview and how do you not be thrown off by some, there's some crazy ones that are out there sometimes, like how do you not be thrown off by some of that in your interview process? So here's my trick. You know, I do a lot of training uh, and I'm standing up in front mm -hmm. of a classroom and I will, you know, relatively often get asked a question I don't know the answer to that I'm not prepared for. And I'm standing in front of a room full of expectant eyes who want to know the answer to this question. And my answer is, that's a really good question. What do you think? we should do in that situation. Mm. What do the rest of you think? I turn the question into a question. And so if the interviewer asks me, um, tell me why you chose to go to this job when clearly that company was in trouble or some something that's, you know, you're not prepared for. Um, well, what makes you, that's a really good question. What makes you think they're in trouble? Or have you ever been in a job that you look back on and say, you wish you hadn't gone there? Somehow turn it into a question back at them, which does two things. One, maybe they satisfy themselves with their own answer and you don't have to answer at all. Or two, it gives you like another 60 seconds to formulate your own thought so you're not caught unaware. So that's my yeah, little yeah. trick is to turn a question into a question back at them. Very good. Very good. So um, what do you think is one thing that everyone could do, you know, when they get off this phone call um, to uh, help themselves find new employment? One thing. 
So I'm at a standing stop. You can share more than one. It, it, you can share more than one if you must, but yeah. <laughs> um, well, the answer I want to give is not going to be immediately gratifying, but it's like the most important thing. It's to really, really take enough. So if you just found out last week or yesterday and you're now like, oh my gosh, what is the one thing? The one thing I would say is you have to really get at the heart of what it is you want to do. So you're looking for the right thing to begin with. And when it comes your way, you recognize it and that you don't jump into the wrong thing. So it's so important to like center and to um, figure out what you would want to do that's different than maybe you have been doing. You can't just automatically go back to the same job title, nor would you want to in many cases. It's that really understanding what is it that you love. So don't be literal. Let me tell you a story. Mm. When I was at Disney, I was in charge of um, Disneyland has a theme park they built called the California Adventure and building that park mm -hmm. was the project that I was the lead um, operations designer on. My main job was building that parking structure that would take all the cars out of the parking lot and put it in this structure so that we could build the park in the lot. So that was the number one first project we had to do. So in my 20s, I was a parking garage designer. And I worked with a leading engineering wow. firm to design a garage that parks a car a second. And there was so much detail around the height of the ceiling and the width of the pylons. And it was done so well that they built the same garage for Universal Studios Florida. And they called me and said, Grace, if you wanna see your garage, it's also in Orlando. It was a very big deal in my career. What does that have to do with what I do now? If you think about that garage, what I was doing was design, taking a commodity and making it be magical from the time you got off the I-5 freeway and into this structure and parked your car. The magic began when you approached the concrete parking structure. I had to somehow make that magical and make that an experience you'd never forget in a good way. And so from being a parking garage designer, I ended up in a sports arena because my job was to make a magical experience for guests. Um, who are arriving. Mm -hmm. And so I just don't be so literal that you're like, there's no parking yeah. garage jobs open. You've got to sort of take at the heart of what is it that you were really doing? There's the job title, but what were you really doing? I was really trying to make magic in something that wasn't very magical and create right. something that would outlive me and it will outlive me. So I guess that's what I want to say is like really get to the heart of what is it that you love doing and you want to do again. And maybe it's a different setting, but it's still something that brings joy to others and to yourself. Great advice. Um, so the one know, thing that we've been saying a lot. Me. You didn't know that about me in the I did garage. not know, know about the parking garage. I had yeah. no idea you designed a parking garage and I have been in that parking garage. Yes, <clears throat> I hope you can now appreciate and I had, it for its car a second brilliance. You need to go sign the wall. I, it is signed. I just like, I'm not there. Oh. I'm not out to you. Yes, I did. Uh, oh, People that's so cool. I love like, it. That's your garage. Grace, I saw your garage today, but there's like a smaller and smaller group who knew me then. Uh, that's so cool. I had no idea. I, know. I had no idea. Magic in the parking garage. I love it. Um, magic was Disney's, is Disney's entire brand, right? Yeah. the magic, magic kingdom. Um, so what we've seen a lot uh, lately, or at least I've observed a lot of people saying is that they keep getting turned down because of overqualification. And, um, and, you know, like I said, we have every kind of layer of, of job that's been eliminated in the travel industry. So how, how do you approach that overqualification word and how can you, um, if, you know, you might be willing to take a different level of job to cross over to a different industry, right? Um, so how is it that people can approach that the word that gets thrown out, you're overqualified? Well, you know, you don't have to put everything on your resume that you did. Oh, really? Yes. Uh now, when they ask you about it, you don't lie, but it's, it's kind of mm -hmm. like a marketing brochure. Mm -hmm. You put your best features on there. Um, you have some semblance of a chronology. So I get the path you've taken, but you don't have to have, if you did five different jobs working for Marriott, you don't have to have all five jobs. You can just have Marriott. 
you know, and talk about mm. like a little bit about the company and then your role, you know, grew, grew through the management system to do such and such and such, to, to manage revenue, to and in charge of the guest experience. Like you don't have to like say every single job. When we were mm -hmm. younger, I feel like we were taught to do that. Like we were taught to put our summer yeah. job scooping ice cream on our resume because we needed to fluff it out. And now we somehow think there's a point of pride to having a three page resume with every single job. But that's not what uh, the applicant tracking system wants to see. And that's not usually what the recruiter or hiring manager needs to see. They want the story. They really want the story. I guess that's the bottom line is you've got to have a story about how the different jobs that you've done lead you to this destination. And so I wouldn't mm. like overemphasize things that you think make you overqualified or unqualified. And I'd find any connection that you can that's not literal to this other opportunity. So let's suppose you're going from hospitality to education. Is that the kind of like mm -hmm. crazy move you're talking that somebody might decide to make? Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I would even call out the, I, am, I loved my time in hospitality because I love giving um, our guests a great experience and memories they'll never forget or the, you know, the angle that's true for you. Um, mm -hmm. But the schedule was very difficult and I really want to do that same thing of making a great experience, but have a more stable schedule to do it in. So I'm not looking to mm -hmm. go back to hospitality. Find something that explains why you would leave that. And right now everyone knows hospitality is in a tight mm -hmm. spot um, and just apply it to the new position. That's assuming that you ever get to have a conversation or that there's a cover letter. Yeah, attached. right. Um, that's why I said you've got to edit your resume and maybe even your LinkedIn profile to sort of like, it's like cleaning out your closet. Like I like all those scarves, but I don't really need them all. It's a conversation mm -hmm. that you'll have. Later, they're going to ask you to fill out an application and you'll put it in there because you don't want to, I'm not saying to lie, but they don't need to see it all. Like you can edit it down. Mm -hmm. So it's like highlights and like the path that you took. So from a resume perspective, um, yeah, I know there's always been a debate about length. Um, I've always believed shorter is better, but um, you know, what, what is someone expecting out there uh, from a resume perspective? I haven't heard much resume talk in the last couple of years. There's almost the talk that we used to have on this topic of long, short, and always keep it to one page or nobody cares. And I've seen it, I've heard it all. No one talks about them anymore. I mean, a lot of people just send LinkedIn profiles. Yeah, right. My, on my LinkedIn and there's really no resume. Sometimes they ask for a bio, which is a, a prose written version of your story. Mm -hmm. um, but like resume is not, I don't think it's the make or break anymore. Yeah, and if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, you need one, um, bottom line. I, I, you, would, I would go without saying, it. I didn't even know I needed to say that. That's like, everything is yes. all LinkedIn. No, there are, I mean, there are people that still, uh, you know, they, they, they took this approach. I don't like social media, so I'm not even going to build my LinkedIn profile. Well, now it's like the number one place to find a job. So you need a LinkedIn profile. Um, you know, I, I find when I can't find somebody on there, I'm like, huh, uh, what's up? <laughs> well, it's, you're not in the modern world if you're not on LinkedIn. Yeah. So you yeah. have to be in the modern world. And my son, um, he's the, the college senior. He has a photo of himself from the prom in there, like with a bow tie. I'm like, no, like your photo matters. <laughs> a, a, you should have one. B, get your roommate, partner, whoever, your kid to take a photo that's somewhat professional looking. And you don't have to be grinning yeah. like on vacation. You could just be professional. You know, you don't mm. have to be um, mm -hmm. like, like at a party. And so like, it's be cognizant that your books, people judge books by their cover still. And, and that's the first impression. Um, I also want to say this one thing, and you can, you can tell me I'm wrong and biased by saying it. People judge you by your email domain. And if you have a Yahoo domain, they are going to judge you. So it really needs to be either Gmail or like your own company, carolhousel.com. Um, they will judge you by an outdated I'm trying to think of an old one that's like you look at it and you're like, no, they, they can't live in my high tech world or my, you know, they don't. What was that dial up one? What was the AOL.com? AOL will kill that will kill your application. You cannot. And I tell people that like this is you got to get a Gmail. Like you can't apply for a job with an AOL. 
um, domain. You just cannot do it. Yeah. So, so you talked about your and, first and time before. Grace, yeah, so Grace, what, um, that leads me to a question then I've got one from the audience I wanna ask, but I wanna yeah. transition to this real quick and then I'll ask that one. How important is your social media profile uh, out there? Not LinkedIn, um, but what you do on social media uh, to your ability to get another job? I think it's pretty important, unfortunately. It's pretty important. It can really, it's never helped you and it almost always sabotages you. Um, yeah. People appreciate Instagrams if they're really artistic and it's related to the industry or job or they just happen to love Instagram. But I never put professional um, connections on my Facebook. Uh, Carol, you and I are connected, mm -hmm. but like I wasn't doing business with you and yet you're still my friend. I yes. didn't have to unfriend you over anything horrible. Um, yes. Carol knows <laughs> that I have called my link, my friend, my Facebook a couple times mm -hmm. recently. Um, I only really use LinkedIn in a business sense. I don't use anything mm -hmm. else. And I, I have a um, pseudonym on Twitter. Like I don't use my own name on Twitter. So mm -hmm. I think it's important that you protect your brand and your reputation and you divide your personal from your professional. That's my opinion. I know lots of other people mm -hmm. have all their business connections. And then they say, I can't put what I really want on there. I can't like things on there because business, mm -hmm. I just, I just separate the two because you can't, pretend it doesn't matter. It does really matter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this question. Um, let's see. I believe it's from Victor. Um, it says, what is your advice prepping for the new way of job interviews via Zoom virtually attire backgrounds? Like, what are you supposed to do? And I also heard someone this week who they had a phone interview and it was a recorded, like it was a autumn, like it wasn't even a real yeah. life person. They just had yeah. to answer questions. Yeah. How do you prep for that? Like, uh, well, the automated one is really hard to prep for. Um, you, I would go on Glassdoor because if they do that all the time, it's on Glassdoor. Somebody will have written on there and said, mm -hmm. um, this is tough and here's the questions we got asked. You should be prepared for. I haven't mentioned Glassdoor yet in this hour, but Glassdoor is like essential. You should always, 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 always read the Glassdoor. If not before you apply, before the interview. So that's number one mm -hmm. is that'll that's the scoop you know like believe glass mm -hmm. door because it's always true so yeah yep. know what you're getting yourself into on those questions um so virtually it's so funny about this like it's such a great question i'd actually love to hear what the others on the phone think about this i think it matters about your background um at, hopefully you have a brack background that's professional and not a dog barking behind you um, and without kids, but I do think it's more forgiving now. I was doing Zoom before COVID mm -hmm. happened and you would always be like very professional and you'd, I'd wear the same clothes on a Zoom that I wore into the office. I'd still wear a blazer and mm -hmm. jewelry. Um, so I just think that is all relaxed now. People eat on Zooms and do things that we wouldn't have a year ago. But I think that you should be cognizant of your background. And I do think you should be cognizant of your appearance. Every single day that I sit in my home office, I like make an effort. Like I put jewelry on, mm. I, I take a shower, I style my hair and people who won't turn on their cameras, like it's very noticeable now. Like it's kind of not cool to not turn on your camera in a business setting, you're expected to do that. And so- um, I used to hate that, honestly, I used to hate it because I just, I, I don't know where to look. I don't know where to, you know, now I'm so used to it, but I used to be like, oh, I don't want to turn a camera on. Um, yeah. But now it's a reality that, um, oh, yeah. and I also think it, yeah. And I think, um, you know, what I've noticed um, is that it makes the conversation easier when the camera's on too, um, than, you know, just being that talking thing behind a picture on the, you know, and, and, and we, and so we have to do it now. I was forced into it. I, I didn't, I didn't really like it, but um, now it's just kind of secondhand. It's second nature. I mean, um, that, the, that we do the, it. For the women that are on this um, Zoom today, I think it's really funny with lipstick. Like we we're all wear lipstick and now we have to wear a mask. So most of the time we don't wear lipstick and the lipstick manufacturers must be going out of business because we just <laughs> don't do it. And, and so who's buying lipstick? But I think that when you're on a call that like matters, like it's an interview or even today with you guys, I put the lipstick on, I'll wipe it off later or it'll be on my mask later. But I think you yeah. have to like almost treat it like an old in-person style. So my son who's interviewing, I've mentioned him three times. He's like, do I wear a suit? Do I trim my beard? 
And I'm like, yes, you should wear a button down shirt and a jacket and a tie, depending on the kind of company that it is, you should wear, um, um, you know, at least visible. And yes, you should trim your beard like it's in person. So my, his brother is also interviewing. He lost his job during COVID. Um, he did the same thing. His suit, one, his suit was extremely tight because he's gained so much COVID weight. Um, so he was like, he couldn't bend his arms yeah. very well because they were so tight. But the funny part is he kept the sweats on in the bottom. And as the interview ended, he stood up to, um, to turn it off and the interviewer caught his sweatpants on the bottom. So just like be really cognizant of what shows on the video when you're absolutely like, interviewing. Well, we're about to our close. Um, we've got just a couple more minutes. And so I just want to tell everyone we're taking a couple week break. Um, and then we're going to be back on, uh, we're going to be interviewing uh, Fran and Ariella Karajian um, from BLLA. The, uh, Fran founded it and her daughter is the COO and uh, they're an amazing uh, mother-daughter combo um, and have built a, an amazing legacy in the, the boutique space. And then um, the, in the middle of November, um, I, I don't know how many of you know this, but Dragonfly's cause is St. Jude. Children's Research Hospital, and I'm on the Digital and Advisory Innovation Committee um, with ALSAC, which is their fundraising arm, and um, we donate a percentage of our revenues to St. Jude every year, and I'm actually going to have a couple people on uh, to talk about that. It's the Thanksgiving month, and so our focus for mid-November forward through to the end of the year is going to be to do a drive for St. Jude. They do phenomenal things. Um, for the for the children and um, and and so that families don't have to pay a dime for anything not their hotel not their food not their health care uh, their flights um, and they also have a database that helps doctors throughout the world um, to uh, treat ch childhood cancer so it's I I'm very passionate about it my mother supported it from the time I was born and I consider it an honor um, to be part of it so I hope you'll join for that. Um, and join us, I'm gonna be doing some matching, Dragonfly will be doing some matching of contributions. And, um, you know, we just look forward to ending this year with a thankful heart, even though it's been super hard. Um, so, you know, I'm thankful that I don't have cancer and um, and I'm thankful that I can be part of the St. Jude community um, in helping children fight cancer and overcome it. So that's um, what's coming and then we're going to take a break um, until January so we're going to it's holidays nobody wants to be on a webinar um, and uh, we're just going to take a break for a few weeks and be back in 2021 which we hope gets started on a new path for all of us yes, yes. Um, so Grace yes thank you so much for being here um, and I want to close with it you know I know you did this at the top of the call but if there's one thing you could say um, to our colleagues in the hospitality industry um, who are hurting right now, quite frankly, a lot of them. Um, what would you say to encourage them? I would say that um, there's probably not a field out there that I can generalize and say their work mattered and they are missed and we are feeling it. It's like they were there for the good times of our lives and that if they could like diaspora through the rest of our society, through the next job that they have. Like, don't ever get like the magic that you brought to people in where you grew up professionally and take it with you to wherever you end up. Because that missing mm -hmm. element of our life that nurtured us and, and brought us like the energy and joy and reset um, is missing and, and noticeably absent. And so like, take that with you and don't ever forget that wherever you land. Oh, amazing, Grace. Thank you so much. I didn't mean that as a pun either. <laughs> <laughs> I just came out. Um, so, but I, I truly appreciate you. I appreciate your friendship and your mentoring along the years with me and your advice and, um, and, and just, uh, you know, the partnership um, that, that we've had over the years. And thank you for being on today. Uh, your advice is, is so valuable and practical. Um, and so we truly appreciate it. And, um, and I hope you have a, a great holidays over the next few weeks um, with your family, that your sons get their jobs um, yeah. soon and um, that life looks better very soon. Yeah. All right. I wish that for everyone. Thanks, Carol. Absolutely. Thanks, Grace. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. See you in a couple of weeks.